it's registering this attentional difference. And then finally, I think I maybe went one too far. Okay, and this is with people who are old and people who are young. So finally, there's an area right in the middle, the kind of front middle of your brain called the anterior cingulate, which uh, registers or which um, which registers um, surprise or registers conflict. So we put people in the scanner and we gave them trivia questions. They gave their answers. They gave their confidence. We gave a whole lot of these questions and we kept track of what their answers were. And then an hour later, we put them in the scanner and we gave them again the question and their answer and the correct answer. And what we then did was look at what their brain was doing. We did a brain scan of what their brain was doing in response to the difference between the correct answer to a high confidence error versus a low confidence error. And these are the images of what we found. And that big red blob right in the middle is the anterior cingulate. So the brain is registering this attentional difference. So high, this is high confidence errors minus low confidence errors. OK. But it, so attention's good, thank you. Uh, that's not the whole story. We also have more knowledge surrounding high confidence errors. Um, Richard Finn and I were testing kids in a paradigm, much like Brady's paradigm, and we'd give them questions. These were kids in the South Bronx. Um, I did work in that school a long time ago. And um, we would give them questions like, what's the largest ocean in the world? And they lived in the South Bronx, and the only ocean that they had ever been to was the Atlantic. And many of them would say the Atlantic. And we'd say, how confident are you? And they'd say, I'm very confident. And then we'd say, no, it's the Pacific. Okay. And what? Many of the children said, for after hitting themselves on the head, was, I knew that all along, right? So we wondered whether people did know it all along. It could just be a hindsight bias. When people learn the correct answer, they, they believe something is going to happen, they make a prediction, and then the classic case is the O.J. Simpson case. You make a prediction, people, there are studies where people made predictions about what was going to happen, what the verdict was going to be in the O.J. Simpson case, and they all thought that he was going to be guilty, right? And then when the verdict came back not guilty, people were asked what they had thought before, and what they had thought before was, was, not, was that he was going to be guilty, but they remembered incorrectly. They had a hindsight bias that they had known it all along, and they hadn't. So this could just be a hindsight bias that the kids, once they hear Pacific, they say, oh, I knew that all along. But it might have been real. So we tested to see whether they really did know it all along. And the way we did that, so first of all, uh, we did this with adults and we did it with children. So I'm going to show you the adult data. And the, they're, they're pretty much the same. The children are a bit messier than the adults on this. Um, adults say they knew it all along selectively to the corrections to high confidence errors, just as children do. They don't say they knew it all along to the corrections to low confidence errors. So is it hindsight bias or do they actually know? So we, before giving them the answer, we asked them to make a second guess. If they actually did know it all along, they'll, their second guess will be higher than, their, than for high than for low confidence answers. 
We gave them a multiple choice test where we took out their, we scanned the alternatives so that if they're, uh, the answer that they gave was one of the alternatives in the multiple choice test, we took it out, okay? And then we looked to see whether the correct answer choice was higher for high confidence than low confidence errors. We gave them the first two letters of the answer. So it's a little fragment completion task. It's PA, right? Would they get it? And would they get it more for the high confidence errors when we gave them, than when we gave them the first two letters for the low confidence errors? And we also scaffolded them by giving them one letter at a time, and then we just counted how many letters they needed to get the right answer. And in all these cases, what we found was that the high confidence errors had more information than the low confidence answers. So people know quite a lot when they make a high confidence error. They've made a mistake, but they're in an area where they have a lot of knowledge. Um, a latent semantic analysis also showed the same thing. A latent anal semantic analysis is kind of the precursor of chat GPT. It's based on how close things are in space. So they're closer in space than for high confidence errors than low confidence errors. So it appears that people have more information. So interim conclusion number one, the Skinnerian belief that errors hurt learning is itself an error. As long as they're corrected, the data indicate that people learn very efficiently from errors. Well, emotional reactions, what about them? That was one of Skinner's objections, by the way, that you didn't want to embarrass kids and people don't want to embarrass themselves. And I think it's something that teachers have to get over um, and students have to get over. They have to set an environment that will be conducive and not threatening. Um, Carol Dweck argued that people who are growth-oriented or incremental theorists uh, frame errors as a challenge and an opportunity to learn. Um, and those people end up being better learners than entity theorists who see errors as a threat. So, um, but it might also depend on how you, the teacher, approach the errors with your students. So I do think that there are personality differences in this. Some people are threatened by errors and you need to be mindful of that. But we did a study where we took it into the classroom and we started to look at how teachers react to errors. Um, and this study just came out like may not actually be in print yet. Um, I corrected the galleys a week ago. So we contrasted explicit instruction versus learning from errors in a, a two-year classroom study with, um, oops, I don't want to go there yet, with kids who were in a, a local high school in New York City, a public school in New York City. Um, and the, there were about 88 kids in each of the two years. And we had, they were preparing for a test that counts. In New York State, all high school children have to take an Algebra I Regents test in order to get high school accreditation. So these children were being, were preparing to take that test and we used that test as our target, performance on that test as our target. Um, we had, uh, we had a um, pretest, which was an old Regents test, which are published actually. So you can get the tests. And we tested all the kids in the program before they started. And then they had a total of 16 sessions of test prep. Um, eight of those sessions were explicit instruction by the teacher using a manual that was designed to help prepare them for this test, okay? So they were taught explicitly by very good teachers um, for eight sessions. In the other eight sessions, 
we had one session where a child would take a test and the teacher didn't even have to be there. They would just do a test. And then the next day, we graded the tests in between, okay? But it was pretty easy to grade because you just scanter on them, okay? So we, get, and we prepared what's called a profile of errors so that the teachers knew what errors the students had made. And we told the teachers to teach to the kids errors. Okay? And they knew what the errors were. So they had four sessions, they had four test sessions. They had four sessions where the teachers taught to the errors. They ignored the things that the kids knew pretty well, or that's what their instructions were. And then they, the kids all then took the um, regions test. And this is their learning. Um, the pretest scores on the left are for the lowest scoring kids and on the right for the highest scoring kids. Um, the learning was the difference between the pretest and the post test. And overall, they gained from these sessions, they gained about 14%. Um, um, here I'm showing the learning from errors as compared, the, the, the learning per hours of teaching for the explicit instruction as compared to learning from errors. And what you can see is that all the teachers were about the same on the explicit instruction. However, there were big differences among the teachers and I'm going to focus on the difference between teacher three and teacher four. Teacher, teacher four was about the same in the learning from errors as he was in the explicit instruction. Teacher three was much better. The, the learning of his students, and the students were randomly assigned, so I don't think it was uh, an incremental versus entity theorist. I think it was what the teachers were doing. Okay, one reason for the differences could have been that some of the teachers failed to teach to the heirs, okay? We told them to do that, but maybe they didn't do it. Um, we had videotapes of everything, though. So my poor undergraduate research assistants spent more hours than I can even tell you going through second by second in the videotapes. So coding, they didn't code below, I think it was four seconds, but anything that was longer than four seconds got coded. So they segmented it into episodes, and the episodes could be things like disciplining the children, giving them instructions, telling a joke, um, teaching, and the teaching was divided into, and we, we knew what the content was as well that they were teaching. So we knew what the errors were on every test and what the teacher told the kids, if it was a, a question on the test, which question it was, and we coded it all. Furthermore, we coded how the teachers taught. So they, the, it was coded whether they were lecturing to the students whether they were interacting with the students, whether they were discussing the problems and why the students had made an error, whether they were proving that the student had made an error, whether they were um, trying to ferret out what the mistake was, interactively asking the students or telling them. Okay, so we had it all coded. So we were able to look at the profile of errors. And I want you to focus on uh, the bottom two, because that's teacher three on the left and teacher four on the right. And this is a pretty complicated graph, so I'm going to step you through it. What we did was rank order the, the, the questions that, this, that each teacher had by his class. They were all male teachers. By his class and um, put the most frequent error on the left and the least frequent error on the right, okay? So that little downward thing is just how frequently each response was given, but we've ranked them to make it easy to read. 
If the teacher taught that error, we put it in black. We coded it in black. And if they did not teach that error, we put it in white, or in gray, rather. And the amount of time that they spent on that error was, in, was the little white dot. And what you can see from this is that all the teachers taught to the errors. And teacher three and four were particularly good at teaching to the errors. And they were virtually indistinguishable. So that is not the reason there was a difference. They all taught to the errors. And teacher four, who was not, who didn't have very, who had, he was a good teacher. In explicit instruction, he was every bit as good as any of the other teachers. But on learning from errors, he was not so good. He, it wasn't because he didn't teach to them. So we thought maybe it matters how you teach to the errors. And since our, we had tortured our poor undergraduates into giving us all the data, we analyzed it. So this is a complicated graph. And what I'm going to do is just go to teachers three and four. And what we looked at was the proportion of time that they were engaged in interactive correction. That's getting to the right answer. The proportion of time they lectured. So when you were lecturing about it, correct, correct, it would be you'd put up the problem and then you'd work it for the kids, OK? And to get to the correct answer. Um, interactive error. So interactive error meant that the, the teacher was interacting with the students, getting them to say, what, what's going on here? And the teacher spent very little time himself talking in the interaction when, when, when we coded his interaction. It was the kids who were talking. And interactive error means that they were talking about what went wrong. Interactive correction means they were talking about how to get it right. And then lecture error. And lecture error was essentially proving that the error was an error. And what you see is that the teacher on the right, who didn't get very good results, did a lot of, he was sort of, even though he was, it was the question that the student had made, the students had made errors on, he was more interested in getting to the correct solution than investigating what had gone wrong. Um, he, was, he also lectured a lot. He lectured a lot more than any of the other teachers, and he was the least effective. So I should not be lecturing here if I want you to learn <laughs> anything. Um, the teacher who was most effective really didn't like lecturing. The dark blue and the dark green bars are his lecture scores, and he just didn't lecture. He asked the students everything, and in particular, he asked them, and the th he asked them about their error. He asked them why, you know, tell me about this. Okay, we then did regressions over all the teachers, and the regressions were individualized to particular student errors and time on each of these four modes of teaching. And what we found was that lecture error actually was negative, more time spent doing lecture air, that mode of teaching was negatively correlated with learning. Lecture correction was also slightly negatively correlated, but not as much so. Interactive correction was kind of neutral. And the only one that was really effective, but it was really very effective, was interactive error. So there's a style of teaching that engages with the error and gets the student, the student themselves, to analyze it and to understand, I think, why they're making the error. And that leads to learning. So there was a gain of about 17% learning per hour of teaching in this mode. Okay. So 
Um, and, and, and indeed, just to go back, that was what the, the teacher who was effective did a lot of that. That's the light green bar. Okay, so interim conclusion number two is how you teach to student errors is crucial. Okay, um, so interactively exploring the reasons for the errors collaboratively with the students is most effective. Finally, what about curiosity? I haven't said too much about curiosity yet. High confidence errors, so we're talking about high confidence errors, are excellent targets for learning for two reasons, both because they're real and also because people almost know the answers. Okay? Such errors seem to be in what we call the region of proximal learning, so, which is riffing on Piaget and Vygotsky, and you all know about that. It's like these, these things that are there are going to be, people are going to glom onto them. Um, here's a little graph of what the region of proximal learning looks like. Um, and what I've plotted on the x-axis is people's either metacognition, low confidence, moderate confidence, high confidence, or mastered, or their knowledge, and those are correlated. And there's a region that's just before you have absolutely mastered in which you're curious. So that's the region of proximal learning. That's where a little bit of effort will have big returns in learning, and then you move it down, okay? That's not to say that you don't go for the more difficult things. What it does avoid is the things that people have mastered. Nobody's curious about their own name, okay? The things that you really know very well, people don't show any curiosity, but high confidence errors, Okay, the, um, in, in the real world, where this boundary between what you absolutely know and have mastered and what you don't know isn't clear, what you'll get is something that's fuzzy. You'll get noise around that boundary, okay? So in fact, the function, that, the curiosity function that we would expect to see in real data is more like that on the right than on the left. And that's what people get when they ask people when you look at the relation between curiosity and confidence. People aren't very curious when they know, when, it's very, when they're very, very, very sure. But they're also not very curious when they really have no idea of what's going on in this unknown territory. Um, tip of the tongue items are quintessential region of proximal learning items, okay? You almost know, everybody's been in a tip of the tongue state, well, we really want to know the answer. And we did a little study on that, and you see that the tip of the tongue items are the ones that are really close to that boundary of knowing, and people are more than twice as curious to know the answers than non-tip of the tongue items. But high confidence errors are also items about which the person has a lot of knowledge and high confidence. So they're in the region of proximal learning. They just happen to be wrong, okay? So we did a study where we looked at people's curiosity when they had made uh, high confidence error when they made all kinds of errors. But what you see here is their confidence in their response. Um, and this is for only for errors. And you, you become more curious as your um, confidence in your mistake goes up. So high confidence errors are in your region of proximal learning. Okay, and there's one more nugget before I turn this over to um, questions. What if you don't give feedback? You ask people for their, their uh, you ask people a question, you ask them for their confidence, so you can plot that, you know whether they believe it or not, but then you ask them, before telling them that they're wrong, you ask them how curious they are. Well, we have a very 
interesting finding that's driving me a little bit crazy. And that is that when we did that, we found, now these are before people have been given the answer. So they're given a question, they give their confidence in their answer, and they give their curiosity. So they've just said, you know, what's the capital of Canada? They say Toronto, high confident. But they're more curious about the answers that they got wrong than the ones that they got right, even at the same level of confidence. And it's really puzzling. It's kind of as if there's a little voice back there saying, hmm, but maybe not. Something wrong here. And the good news for teachers, for us, is that they want to know. Okay? They're not blocking. They want to know the answers. So they've got some sort of signal that, hmm, they're curious. The curiosity is itself kind of a signal. And they're eager to learn. That's what curiosity means. And we've, when we got this, we were very surprised. We've replicated it five times now. So I think I would love to see it replicated in a different lab, but we ourselves have replicated it five times. So people are more curious when they've made a mistake with high confidence than uh, when they're right with equally high confidence. It's as if their own curiosity is alerting them to the possibility that there may be more there than meets the eye, and they want to know. Conclusions. OK, errors help learning, and you should encourage and explore rather than ignore them. Um, high confidence errors are in the student's region of proximal learning, where they both learn very efficiently and where they're highly curious. Students' high curiosity about their own high confidence answers may be a marker that they suspect that they're wrong, and also that they're highly re receptive to finding out more. They're curious. Um, this curiosity about these particular errors presents a wonderful opportunity for us. And finally, to be most effective, the feedback you provide needs to be highly interactive, exploring the errors together with your students and feeding their curiosity. Practical advice. Steve Chu told me that I had to come up with a nugget of practical advice for you. So I've been, you know, try. So here's my try, Steve. Um, you know, sometimes you see a student, you ask them a question, and they get it wrong. That happens, I mean, it happens all the time, right? Well, instead of avoiding that, or instead of even giving them the right answer, like, this is an opportunity to just delve down. So find, when they do that, you know what to do now. And if you do it, I mean, my bet is that it's go your students are going to be both more curious and more eager, and that they'll learn the material. Okay, so that is, thank you. Thank you. There, there was more than one nugget of, of great advice in that talk, <laughs> I want you to know. Do you have questions? Let's see. Really interesting talk, Janet. And, uh, so with the practical advice, I was reminded during your presentation of another presentation I saw, not, not at this conference, but one like it, where the argument the person was making is that we should begin our lectures by asking our students a question related to the material, but one they're very likely to get wrong. And then tell them that's wrong. Yeah. And then lecture. Uh, and so oh, work yeah. with them through the lecture. And then by the end, revisit that and, and come. Would that, do you think that sounds like a practical implementation? I think of what it sounds about? great, actually. Yeah. Um, I re there was a, a woman, um, her name is Mary Bullock, who was a, a, an assistant professor who used to start off all her lectures, psych lectures, 
with all the misconceptions. People think this, people think this, people think, and she, it was kind of like she'd get the class to agree to all these things, and then she'd systematically go through. I mean, she could have done it instead of lecturing, she could have done it more interactively. That's my only complaint. But it sounds great. I mean, engaging with errors, instead of wanting to just fill up the, you know, fill up the pot, seems great to me. Hi there. Hi, I'm over here. I'm right here. Hi. Hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi <there. laughs> Sorry. Um, I am wondering if you see this very helpful information relating um, only or mostly to um, facilitating teaching approaches, or can it also apply to grading strategies? I mean, do you recommend um, rewarding students for interrogating their errors or investigating them more deeply? You know, um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's worth exploring. And I think we, it would be great to do some really solid research on it. My intuition tells me that um, letting students do things like take tests again um, and going over their errors. And I, you know, I do things like, if many, pe many students in my class make the same mistake or don't know certain material, I tell them, I'm gonna put a bonus question on on the next test. I really am serious about wanting you to know this. You know, Bayes' theorem is one of my favorite. And um, they then, instead of just letting it drop, they then really work it. And you don't have to give them much of an incentive to do that. But I haven't systematically studied that, but I would bet on it. Hi, thank you, that was really wonderful. Um, and I'm thinking the whole time about practical things. I've been doing collaborative testing in a really large class. Oh. And it's been fascinating because they take it twice and in between we discuss, but we discuss in small groups and I wander around the room. And some students, the ones who really engage and are willing to ask the questions and really to really dive in, are yeah. really benefiting from it, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking, how can I scale that up to the folks who are just kind of doing it on their own and not really engaging in the collaboration? Yeah. But here's my question is, what, what are you thinking about sort of the, you know, secondhand smoke effects of diving into a question with one person in front of others yeah. And especially if the curiosities are different or the knowledge levels are different. You yeah, know? It's, 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 it's very tricky. It's very tricky. Um, we actually have done a study on something like that and the person who's actually asking and answering and interacting gets much more benefit than the others. And I guess the smaller the group, the better for that. Um, I, I, if you come up with an answer, I'd really like to know. <laughs> because you want to have each child, you don't, you, don't want any, you don't want any freeloaders on this. You want each child to engage. So in, seminar, in, in psych seminars, I give points for participation. That, and if somebody isn't answering, so you, I, I actually chart it. Someone isn't answering, then you know, I set, I, I tell them and I set them up and I say, okay, I'm gonna give this question because I know you're shy so that you can prepare the answer in advance and after a few things like that, they seem to, they come up, they, 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 they open up and they stop being afraid. And you know, in lab group, the door is locked so it's within the family and you can make as many mistakes as you want. No one is judging you, we just want, but we're, we're all gonna try to get, you know, to, to figure this out and to not have any mistakes eventually when we present to the world. So we don't want the mistakes on the tests that count, by the way, of course. Like when they are taking the regents, the, the official regents test, that is not the time for making mistakes. It's when the, clo when the doors are closed and you're preparing, so. But our seminars are like that, so. I, I, I don't know how systematically to do it. It's very hard. The, the, the person, the, the individual shyness component is still something that's very hard to overcome. But at least if the teachers know to try to do it, it we're, we're halfway there. 
What did, yeah. what was that? Um, <clears throat> you, most of, I'm over here, to your right. Uh, are you? There are we are. <laughs> Um, most of the research uh, that you've discussed seems to involve content that's more or less semantic knowledge. I'm wondering what research has been done or what you think might happen um, if you were trying to correct errors about things the students have emotional attachment to. Um, yeah. When you're talking about misconceptions, um, yeah. they're not isolated. They're often they're embedded in person's social and cultural belief system. Yeah. So it w I'm wondering if, you c if the hypercorrection effect would work if you were trying to c correct the belief that, say, learning styles uh, are, are yeah. Uh, real. Yeah. Um, I, they're, they're, they're undoubtedly, I've dealt with cool material mostly. And it's, it, I don't know whether it applies. So. When people are highly confident, they might be highly confident because they have a lot of, they have quite a bit of knowledge, but they've just sort of hit the wrong thing. But sometimes when people make a high confidence mistake, they know perfectly well that the rest of the world doesn't agree with them or that the, you know, that Wikipedia would say something different or the New York Times would say something different. Or, um, and in those cases, that kind of belief where they know what the, they, they, where they don't believe the authority, actually, where they don't, may be different. So, and emotional things may be different. So, I think it would be very worthwhile to, they may not be different. They may not be different, and that would be really exciting, because then our job would be quite easy, I, I suspect, or easier than we think. But they may, but it may be that some of the questions that they give high confidence to are these sort of slips where they have a lot of information and they've just made a sort of neutral mistake. And some of them are these fighting points where I know you all think I'm wrong, but I'm not, right? And those may be, so it may be a bimodal distribution and I just don't have enough data at this point to tell. All right, let's, let's thank Dr. Metcalf one more time. For this. Thank you. And with that, we're at lunch.